Welcome to the Flying Monk talk show, Anthony Cummins. Uh, I've wanted to talk with you on the show for a long time because you've been posting videos for about 10 years. I've been secretly following you for about 10 years. Uh, and it's been getting progressively more interesting, I have to say, because you've been doing a work of research that I think very few people uh, especially in the early years, wanted to do because it kind of smashed a lot of the myths that were out there in the community. We're going to talk about that later on, but can we start by, um, let's discuss how you first got interested in Japanese martial arts. Right, well, I've been asked this question a million times and it's always the same, Is it was just born into me. Mm. not gone for the Chinese, I've not gone anywhere else, just I had this love of Japan from the beginning. I remember going to the toy shop with my grandfather and him saying, do you want like this toy or do you want some ninjas? Because it was the 1980s and there was ninjas everywhere. And I just knew in my head, I was like, of course, ninjas. Why are you asking me? <laughs> Stupid man. <laughs> you know what I'm thinking? But is there even a choice? So from there, I've always loved ninjas all the way through. And of course, samurai. Did you get involved in the the whole master Hatsumi, Stephen yeah. Hayes. And yes, I was. I was an absolutely in there. That is why I went to Japan the first time. I went to Japan to train with Hatsumi the first time. Mm. What was your impression back then when you first went of Japan and everything? Of Japan or of that? Because you are going to open a can of worms there, which is we fine. Want to. We, want, we want to have frank discussions. So okay. Yeah. Of everything, really. Yeah. J Japan, the culture, the system, the teacher, everything. Right, okay. Uh, in Japan, uh, Japan was wonderful, to be honest, but it's not... You, we get fed the mythical tales, and we think that the Japanese, these mythical... They're absolutely just down-to-earth normal humans. And to be fair, they're probably more shopaholic than we are. They're more materialistic than we are. Like, I got brought up on the... Oh, the Japanese use the right-hand side of their brains, and they do... You know, they deal in a different way. No, that's, they argue with each other, they bicker, they shop, they collect. Their houses are not all zen. They're not. All, they're filled with clutter. <laughs> Japanese houses just are filled with clutter. You have to be rich to be into zen. Because <laughs> the houses are so small and they've got so many things. They're good at putting things in different drawers and putting things away. But mm. yes, they are packed. Mm. Um However, it was a big slam in my faith at this time. So if, for those people who don't know what I do, basically I've gone on a crusade to correct ninjutsu. And ninjutsu is not a form of specific hand-to-hand -hand combat used by the ninjas. There is no such thing. It was invented. So at this time, though, I didn't know that. So I went along to the dojos, to different masters, a couple of them actually, and I was so shocked at, A, how dirty it was. The dojos were filthy. There was no order. There was no organization. And the first question I was asked is, are you going to pay money? And I was like, whoa, you know, this was just... I, at this point, had got a letter translated. I'd spent quite a lot of money having this letter translated, thinking I was going to this utopian Zen masters, you know, <laughs> retreat. And it was just full of Americans and French. It smelled of, no joke, it smelled of Western takeaway food. You know, because people had all brought their packed lunches. And <laughs> shoes everywhere. And it was money, money, money. I was just like, whoa, what is going on? But that doesn't mean that they were necessarily different to the other people. Uh, you know what I mean? There, there was lots of that in Japan. Money makes the world go around in Japan. You have shattered many myths that, okay, ninjutsu is not a martial art. So what is the Bujinkan? Just to be very clear, what is uh, Hatsumi Sensei teaching from your research? Okay, so basically, now this is really the sort of can of worms that's been opened is, are they real, are they not? Now, they claim to have nine schools within them. Now, and they claim to have a very old history. However, they don't appear anywhere until roughly the 1960s, maybe around then. They just don't appear. And when you actually watch what they do, it's a mixture of correct samurai arts, you know, like basically what you would consider as jujitsu. However, and 
I, with all honesty, there's lots of things thrown in there that are just made up. So, but that might not be Hatsumi Sensei's fault totally, even though it, he can't be taken away from it wholly. Because people, like, they're, what's the word? They're encouraged to make new forms. And what I noticed is nobody's ever said, nobody ever says, oh, that's bad in the Boonji can. It's just like, yeah, well done, well done. And they just go away and teach that. And you end up with this wave effect of just random things being taught that have no basis in anything. So they oh. mix like special forces stuff in the West and things like that, you mean? No, like so comic book stuff. Comic book stuff, okay. I'm talking like real, you know, I've watched the most, I was in, sat in the dojo, you're going to get me killed by the way, sat in the dojo and uh, some guy, there was a knife to a woman's throat and this guy came up with the most ludicrous way to get around this using his bum and using all it and it was just like you know he was but yeah it was like yep yeah, well done next everyone try that mm. like what so i actually did an experiment one day and i've been keeping this story sort of like a bit <laughs> secret, right? I, did, I did an experiment one day and i noticed them watching me at the dojo and the next move was the move i had just made up the time before so on the next move was the one I, so i found i think he's just run out of things to teach and everybody's expecting this wonderful new thing they go to japan for this please teach me something secret and wonderful mm. and he's mm. done that for like 30 or 40 well 40 or 50 years now and you've, you've got to run out of things really mm. most people don't realize that he's actually dropped his kata the original kata that was allegedly passed to him has now pretty much been Reduced to nothing, they don't do it. But there's a big story about his teacher who was meant to be this famous ninja. So who was he? Did you find out who he was? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's well documented on Wikipedia. It's, it's right there. Mm. Takamatsu Sensei, he's called. Mm. However, <laughs> he seems to be a character that made it all up, to be honest. The lineage that he put forward actually has comic characters in it. And when it was first recorded in a big book, basically, in Japan, of all the schools, they said this is fictional, but it's a good piece of work. And uh, it's basically, from a historical point of view, it doesn't stand up. It sounds like a 20th century creation with characters in it that are actually from comics. So it's like saying Wolverine is in our school and Mm. Sir Xavier and this guy said he was like an assassin for the government but people have since done research and found out he actually couldn't get in for medical reasons into the military mm. and then other people have said oh he was in China doing this and it's just basically it boils down to he said he was doing it but most yeah. of the proof shows he wasn't I see then all of the ninja films from Japan with the you know, all of the typical ninja things. Did that come from Hatsumi's influence or from books? Where did that all come from? Right, you start off in the ninjas, you start about 1910 with Gingetsu Ito. Gingetsu Ito, sorry. And he starts doing some research. Because you've got to remember, the last ninja are roughly 1860s, 1870s. That's And the job officially finishes. I've actually got documentation where a ninja says we have now finished samurai have ended we have ended done mm. and then it's probably passed on but we found no evidence anywhere of ninjutsu being passed on past that date so you get by the 1910s you get this guy who comes along and says what are these ninja that we we've heard about in like legends and all this and he does some study and then you hit the 1930s pre-war and you get um, the a guy called Fuji Taseiko really studying the old manuals. And he actually teaches at the spy school in Japan before they go to war. But he's Ooh. only teaching it from his reading. But after the war, his books go a little bit crazy. And he's got all the shuriken are in it and the secret this and the secret that. And that's the first real time it really starts to become a bit on the crazy side. And then the films take from his books. So more, his books were famous and popular and the films nicked that. And then it is assumed by the people who don't believe in the Bujinkan that Takamatsu Sensei, Hatsumi's teacher, just took it from these books, created it 
and then Anne from the films. And of course, they helped with some of the films like uh, Shinobu no Mono series. They actually were then helped. So they sort of played off each other. And the books were novels or technical manual type of... Technical manuals, there's um, quite a few of them. It was a bit of a ninja craze, to be honest, in Japan. Mm. People don't realise that there was this big ninja craze in sort of like 1910, and then there was a big ninja craze in the 1960s. Mm. That's where you get James Bond comes in, 1962-ish. Yeah. And it's literally coming off that Japan craze as well, because um, Fleming went to Japan and was like, what's all this? You know, <laughs> what, what, what are your spies like? And they went, hey, here's a book, ninjas. Wow. Was that Sean Connery was involved yeah. with the ninjas in his movie? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You only and Hatsu like, Hatsumi was working on that movie, or his uh, teacher? I think he's in it, or he's around okay. that area. Yes, mm. he's in it, I think. But mainly they worked on Japanese films. What 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 a lot of people don't realise is these books from Japan, and these were then obviously people made films, because the people who made the films, the producers, were not historians, but they bought the books from the bookshop, and like, oh, this must be real then. Sure. And then Stephen Hayes goes across to Japan, and gets the books translated, he's got a Japanese wife, and he starts, you know, publishing bits from here and there. And the rest of us, or the rest of the people did. But when I got to Japan, I was like, that's not right. Mm. That cannot be right. Mm. And it's all down to Stephen Turnbull. I assure, I assume you know who Stephen Turnbull is, yeah? One of his books says, he quoted an old document, and it said, um, let's take, take 10 of your best samurai and train them in ninjutsu. And I was like, hold on, 10 of your best samurai, which means best fighters in this mm. case, you need to train them in a special martial art. Why on earth would you train your best ones in the special martial art? So it just was like that. It entered this logic loop that wouldn't let me out. And that cracked it open for me. OK, what step did you take next? Because there's this uh, period of disenchantment and then your first book came out. What was in between? Right, OK, so... At the time, I was working as an English teacher. I just finished my university degree, which was uh, in history at Manchester, uh, archaeology and history. And I was on my last day at university and I was using their internet because it was free and cheap back in student days. And it said, would you like to work in Japan? I was like, yes, I would. And they happened to be having a, an, an interview that, that week for in Manchester for teaching English in Japan. So I got there. Did everything I've just told you, which was the sort of, you know, go and see Hatsumi. And I was specifically there to train with Hatsumi. And then obviously that broke, uh, you know, the idea broke in my head. And I went, came back and did my master's degree. And I was thinking all year, at this point, I still believed in Hatsumi. But I was thinking all year, what can I do? I need to get back to Japan. So I went back for, with a different company to teach again. And this year, this time, what I did is I took the photocopies I'd collected at the Ninja Museum of um ninja manuals like they have like a little pamphlet that you can take so i photocopied it took it to my english class and said can you translate that this mm. ninja manual who can do it and i gave it to everybody and everybody said that's too difficult that's it's like <laughs> we beowulf it's a too difficult answer mm. except one which was yoshie minami and she was like ah, she just wrote it out for me and there you go she had a she had a degree in linguistics from a really high level university. And she's like, no problem, I can do that. So I said, let's go for a coffee. <laughs> let's go. And from there, we act, that's where it started. I said, right, let's get everything we can. And for the next two or three years, we actually published a book to test if we could work together in Japanese, which was just on the English language. It's actually how to swear in English. It's up for the Japanese. So, uh, but that, that, we worked how to work together then. Mm. And uh, yeah, we just started getting every piece of information we could visit in every museum. And then we started to realize we needed to build a shape of ninjutsu. What was the shape? And that's where we started, scroll after scroll after scroll. And how did you find this family who then entrusted you with these scrolls? What was, what was that all about? How did you find them? I, well, you've jumped about eight years there. Okay, well, let's go back then. Let's, <laughs> let's take it step by step. Yeah. step yeah. So the next thing was fine. So first of all, go to a place called Jimbo Cho, which is the um, old book antique shop in um, Japan, in Tokyo. It's got a basically a street of antique bookshops. And we got every ninja book I could. 
I said I want every ninja book. We went to the museum. I photocopied everything that was possibly there. And some of the people in Japan had websites going up. I just literally hammered everything. We printed it out, got it there and started to build. However, it soon became obvious that you can only do a few things in Japan. One is get them from public libraries. So if it's in a public library, you just go along and you pay your money and you get it. You know, it's that simple. Um, the next step was actually trying to find private uh, people with private collections and that's where most ninja scrolls are nearly all ninja scrolls are in the private collection sort of domain so we i've got access probably if i was to add it up to about 15 to 20 percent maybe 15 percent of the scrolls mm -hmm. and then there's look on the um auction market for scrolls being sold and they are rare like rare uh one scroll went for ten thousand dollars in private hands sort of you know here you go and i found three copies of it by divine fate if you like <laughs> just three of them just turned up this guy had just paid ten thousand dollars for it and i think i paid 15 quid mm. by accident some old guy wizened old guy with long fingers went have a look at this <laughs> like, in a bookshop in a so, bookshop in tokyo yep yeah wow it was actually pretty, it was really good. It was in a, we went to this book. It was a fair that was only on for two days. They all set up with their antiques. And this old man was like, come and look at this glass cabinet. I was like, no, it'll just be the same old, same old. And, and when I got there, it was, it was um, flower arrangement or fireworks or this. Mm. At the same time, I admit my translator, because my Japanese is terrible. There's no way native people can uh, sorry english native people can translate native japanese medieval japanese it's just it's a different world totally you'd have to be not me basically someone a bit cleverer than i am and this guy opened it up and i had my translator there and she'd literally been working on a section of this scroll we'd found a couple of pages of and the writing is called so show it's so spidery and she was like anthony buy this scroll it's only like 15 quid i was like I get it we got it to a coffee shop opened it up and there it was the scroll we've been working from ninja this ninja that ninja and it was possibly one of the original versions it's from 66 wow. 78 it was really old wow which family was that from that is from a school called mubyoshi ryu and that's the hagihara or hagiwara family this guy impressive he was around in the mid 1600s and he seems to have been a little bit of a, an idiot when he was younger and started some fights and it ended up with revenge attacks on him. So he went out and studied under all the masters he could, including ninja tricks, and then put together a school to defend himself. Apparently he fought or killed 33 people. We're not sure. It seems like it's got this really abstract intro that says he was in danger 33 times. Truly mm. in just seven of those, but always one. So we assume he killed them because otherwise they'd keep coming from him. But yeah. And his school became one of the most trained schools in that province and lasted to this day. It lasts to this day. What is it called now, the school? Mubioshi Ryu. Okay. But it is hanging on by a thread and they didn't have any ninjutsu left. I actually gave the ninjutsu Ooh. back to their school. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. Jiu-jitsu and I gave them their ninjutsu yeah. back. <laughs> For which they must be very happy. Now they're pouring over the scrolls and trying to recreate the skills. We let's actually, bring, go let's on, bring in, at this point, let's bring in your book. Yep. Because um, we have two books here, and I'm going to do separate reviews another time of these, but oh. this is uh, Iga and Koka Ninja Skills, and Anthony Cummins and Yoshie Minami. Yes. And this is, this is like hundreds of interesting little mystical and practical skills all woven together. And then the, the latest book, I believe it's your latest book, is Ninja Skills. The authentic ninja training manual and this is this is really cool because um it is uh illustrated with little pictures of you kind of you graphically uh showing the the skills and this is your latest book i believe it's your latest book at the moment the one yes. you sent me is ninja skills the authentic ninja training manual and um anywhere we open it up there's very 
very cool little, uh, let's find a good example, illustrations. I really like the illustrations in here because they're simple. And like, okay, soaring through a wall, for example. I mean, they're just, it's what it says it is, but it gives you little tips and tricks that you just wouldn't think of. Like, do you stay on the smoky side or the non-smoky side? You just wouldn't think of it. But when you learn it, then you understand the, you know, yeah. the reason for it. It's really a nice book, a good book, a practical book. You could take this away and improve your ability to survive, not as a ninja, but as a human being. So it's a very useful book. Um, I'm going to review this yep. separately, but uh, let's continue with the story because the last one was was very cool. So what happened then? So you started to find these books and scrolls and then what was the next step? So we started to find the books and scrolls and we then started publishing all the ninja manuals started coming out. So you just pulled up Chikamatsu's then, which mm -hmm. is a, a Eager and Coco Ninja Skills. That one was wonderful. It was a case of you've got to be clever in the way that you find the scrolls. Don't just look for the word ninja. They never really just bang ninja on it, very rarely. And if they did, they're famously, they're already famous. Mm. You know them. So that one was actually called Yokan, which, and, and it's got multiple scrolls called Yokan. And Yokan is the Japanese pronunciation of Sun Tzu's 13th chapter, which is the use of spies. So Interesting. Spies. Mm. So I said to Yoshi, I said, let's look under Yokan. I bet there's some up there. And we got it and we found. Now, the guy who wrote that is called Chikamatsu Shigenori. And he wrote, I don't know if you've ever seen it. There's an old Tuttle book and it's called Stories from a Tea Room Window. And it's, it's you know, you know, Tuttle, the publisher. They're one of my yeah. publishers. They've got it. It's been out for years. And it's just little stories like this Lord had such a tea set. And this, you know, it's it's in the tea world. And the introduction says, oh, it's by Chikamatsu Shigenori, who also happened to do warfare. Mm. It's like the biggest understatement in the world. Chikamatsu Shigenori <laughs> wrote about 150 treatises on warfare and about five or six of them were ninja. And that's that book. So we honed in on that and mm -hmm. pulled it out. And he said, the reason for that is he said, ninjutsu is falling. It's literally dying. It's about 1719. This he said, it's collapsing. So I'm going to record both Iga and Koka. The famous traditions puts them all down. So we wow. start producing books like that, basically, and going around getting mm. scrolls. Is that one published in Japanese by somebody else already? So you can buy it as a Japanese book? No, I actually gave it to Koka City and they thanked mm. me for giving it back to their city which was nice oh. and it ended up in a, they've just produced a limited edition book with sections from it. And I've luckily or ha happily, I've got my name in the back saying, thank you to Anthony Cummings for giving us this back type job. Fantastic. Yeah. And um, the military side of it. So like military strategy, obviously yeah. ninjutsu would have been used by some military strategians or generals. So did you also look for like military like pure military strategy scrolls, things like that? Or was that a little bit outside the scope of what you would consider ninjutsu? So that's this leads us now into the family conversation. So we've okay. done everything. We've done the Bansen Shukai, which was massive. The book of Ninja 500 pages. We've done the Shoninki. We've done Igno. We did everything that was in the public sort of sphere, if you like, that we could do. And then it became obvious, we got to this point there, this is like five years later, where we'd actually now built up an understanding of what ninjutsu was. We were like, okay, we got it. So every new manual we were getting, we were like, eh, it's sort of the same, isn't it really? You know, it's the same. Yeah. So what happened was, uh, there's a book here, if you don't mind, just, just to put it in context. There's this book, which is called True Path of the Ninja. It's actually the first one we did. Mm -hmm. But this is a ninja manual called Shoninki. And it's been quite famous in Japan for about 100 years. Well, in the ninja world. And it was there. It's by a man called Natori Masazumi. And I was like, we need to find more by this guy. Who is this Natori Masazumi? Mm -hmm. And through a sort of a couple of steps of logic, through using his pen name and different bits, it turns out he'd written something like 20 odd scrolls on military warfare. Mm. All about military. And that book fits on the end. So from beginning to end, it's all military. And that's where it goes in. 
Now, this is where people, so you've hit the nail on the head, is Shinobi is, is ninjutsu is useless on its own. Mm. Actually part of military training. Without a, So, you know, when you said you pick up the book and you can see little bits that you can use, it's like, I can take that and use it. Yes. Well, actually, ninja had all of their warfare put down and then ninjutsu on top. So it really fits in with everything. Mm. Full lot fits together. And Natori Sanjuro Masazumi, that guy, realized again that things were declining. So he started at the beginning for a warrior. And the first scroll is called Heika Jodan, which means conversations for warrior families in times of peace, which means here's your basics. And then he goes through everything. Uh, water, aquatic warfare, um, frontline warfare, armor, everything, all the way to ninjutsu. And that's where I found this. If, do you mind me going on? No, it's interesting. Basically, basically, we found all these scrolls bar a couple, and it was amazing. They all interlock with each other. And if you study it as an entire system, it's, it's wonderful. Mm. But one day, we kept looking for his grave, and nobody's found it in 100 years. Nobody. So we kept looking and looking, and we knew it was from a city, but there's something like a thousand temples in this city with like a million graves or something. There's no way you'd find it. But one day there was a, a wind, a typhoon, and um, we searched on the internet just by random again, and it was a couple of days after the typhoon, and we found a blog by a monk, and the monk said, could the Natori family please visit? We have um, the grave, some of your graves have been damaged in the typhoon. So we phoned up the right place, the right name. Have you got this ancestor in your temple records? And he went and had a look and he's like, yeah, yeah, we've got him. And we found one of the world's most famous ninjas. And wow. then that, we found the family that are still in existence. And the family didn't know they were a ninja family. <laughs> so I had to go and tell this family, I said, you're all, you're basically a ninja descendant. And they're like, really? You know, they knew they were samurai mm. and they knew they were high ranking. They have stories in their family of when the shogun had give them gifts and things mm. like that. But everything was destroyed in World War II. They even took me to the place where the old house was and everything mm. was destroyed. So I actually presented them back with their scrolls. And they, of course, being the head of the family, and that's how it works in Japan, gave me permission to bring them back out and teach them across the world because of the work I'd done. Before we get to the teaching, so they didn't have the scrolls in their house. So how did you get the scrolls? So the notorious scrolls. So the Shoninki, the Shoninki, the True Path of the Ninja is mm. famous. You can pretty much get it in Japan. It's been published mm. three times in Japanese. Mm. But nobody had ever found anything else by him. They just thought that mm. was it. But actually, his name is Natori Sanjuro Masazumi. But at the air, in the introduction, uh, which is written by somebody else, they call mm. him To Isui Sensei. Now, obviously, we all know what uh, Sensei means. But To Isui means like Master Isui from the Fujiwara line. And it was like, you know, what's that? So I said to Yoshi, let's just look for his pen name, To Isui. So we went and looked in all the libraries for this To Isui guy, and it came up with one. And it just said this Heika Jodan, this scroll for family discussions. And in the back of that, it gives you a list of another 10 scrolls. And in them, I went and found the other 10 scrolls, and in them, it gives you the names of all the different scrolls. So by the end of it, it would piece together something like 20 odd scrolls from wow. that. That is incredible detective work, really. <laughs> so As a historical researcher, it's brilliant. Yeah, well Thank done, you. really. Really, I think people, people in the West don't quite realize what a many, many, many steps have gone into finding what has become the, your books. Mm -hmm. It wasn't as simple as somebody just came and handed you the scroll. So that's, that's really interesting. Yeah. I have spent thousands of pounds, literally thousands of pounds on going around, like, well, getting scrolls printed off. And mm. sometimes they come back as totally useless. We've spent most on useless scrolls. But then bit by bit, you get those moments where you're like, bang, 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 and it all falls into place. Yeah. Like, so you've been led in a circular kind of path from ninj ninjutsu to almost samurai method, samurai school, yes. with ninjutsu as a speciality subset you could say it's exactly it yes so what you're publishing now is going to be samurai skills which is your is that your next project that you were talking about on a 
one of your films. No, actually, hold on. We've just we've just published. Well, I say just in the last three years. So here you go. So this kanji here mm. that says Natori Ryu. So the school of the Natori family. So from the Good start family. of that one, we mm. found that. I went and found, and these are the scrolls from the story I've just told you. And mm. the aim is to put them all together. And they Fantastic. should be roughly about eight books when we've finished. How many have you got so far? These two? These two? Yes. Great. So, I'm, I'm happy you published them in hardcover as well, much more enduring and quality. Was, was that <laughs> your decision or the Watkins publisher? Well, you're in the world of publishing there. So that is yeah. the world of shut up, author. You've got no choice and you will be happy that we are doing your book. <laughs> <laughs> However, so, for example, in publishing, normally the first book comes out in hardback. It then goes after the first thousand or so copy into paperback. However, because of the social media and just because of the, the drop in book sales, they've now started going mainly to paperback. But I luckily have fell into a niche there where they said we'll keep that in hardback. That's very good. Yeah. Much more enduring, I think. Yeah. So you have another eight uh volumes at least of this particular scroll and okay it's a long way into the future what's your long-term uh goal and work how do you see things progressing after this particular scroll do you have other scrolls to to work on after this one i think i've got more work than i can do in this lifetime to be honest okay. without a doubt but my plan i've planned my life up until i'm 80. I intend to retire at 80 and die at 89 because I want to die at 90 because that sounds cool, but I don't think I'll make it. So I'll <laughs> die at 89. So between now and then, I've got to answer one question, and that is what did the Samurai Ninja actually do? Mm. That's my one question. Mm. And it will take about another 40 years to get that sorted, I think, because we are just like, as I say, we're going through that school now. And that will take a lot of time. But in the meantime, I put different books in. Ooh. So if you don't mind, I've, let me explain the types of books I do. I do academic style trans, uh, translations with my translation team. They do the bulk of the translation. But then, of course, you know, you've got history degrees and everything. You go through it, make sure everything's correct and actually produce, turn it into a book. And then from there, so they go out, but they go out very rarely because it takes a long time to translate the next one is things like ninja skills. Now, the reason I've done ninja skills like that with the cool pictures is because I realized I was producing this work and people were not understanding it. To be to be honest, they were like, uh, I'm not sure really. Mm. You know, I get it, but I don't get it. So I've thought, right, have you noticed I dress in black in it and they've got that? Because it's sort of that half enter a fantasy world and, half, and, and mm. based on truth. So I produced those books by myself. And then I produce a third type of book, which is literally little anecdotes of fun that I've picked mm. along the way. So I did a book last year called Old Japan, which is just stories from Old Japan, you know, like uh, put off at the steps in the snow by his crazy nephew because his mother-in-law wanted to get rid of him or something like that. And he was like, okay. so I just boil that down and there you go. It's fun, you know. Which which of the three types are the best selling, are selling uh, the best? Best selling are mm, actually, I would say the best selling one is True Path of the Ninja. That's because it's been mm. out the longest. But then mm. Book of Samurai, which is the uh, sorry Book of Ninja, which is the Ban Senshukai. But the problem is everybody wanted the Ban Senshukai before I published it. It was famous already. Mm. So when you say which is best selling, the academic translations are. However, that's probably because people already wanted them before I started. I see. How do you produce your books with your translator, Yoshie Minami? So she's in Japan, you're here. Do you do a, you just conference as much as possible or how does it work? She's a translator and you then go through it with a fine tooth comb and edit and so on. Yep. So basically she, well, the first book we ever did, obviously I was living in Japan at the time, but I came home and then the first book we did, we actually did by email before Skype. So she would send me a chapter and I would put all the notes in and she sent it back until we just went back and forward and back and forward. And then, of course, by that point, I'd flown to Japan and we just went through it with a fine tooth comb. Then, of course, Skype came. 
But I'll be honest with you, I spent most of my life savings. I was very good with money. I saved money very well. But I uh, obviously don't earn it so well. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> it's difficult to get people to buy this stuff. But I just spent it going to Japan and going through it with her. Just sat there with her and went through it and went through it. And then at the weekends, we went away and got sort of um, new scrolls to do. We actually published a book in the middle of publishing a big book just to have a break. Mm. <laughs> it was that We did that. <laughs> For all those aspiring authors watching this, or writers, you know, especially in martial arts, we know that there's, uh, there's, it's not the biggest money-making thing in the world to be a martial art writer. But can you now survive on this uh, as your full-time work, just writing? Considering you're the top in your field of this particular niche market, are you now able to at least make a living? Just. But I'd probably earn more if I went somewhere else like McDonald's. <laughs> so, no, a lot of people think I am wealthy and rich and all this, but no. So if you want to know about publishing, basically the standard contract is 10% of what the yes. publisher gets, yeah. which I then share with the translators. So it becomes 50-50. So for every £10 you earn or $10 you earn, you get one pound, one dollar, which means I get fifty p, fifty cents. Yes. You have to sell a lot. Yes. To keep. I it. know. I know. I write books, and I understand totally. Yeah. yeah. It's just a nightmare, but yeah. just. And however, my next book is going to be the Art of War. I don't mm -hmm. know if you've seen that. So hopefully, I'm doing. See what we did with Ninja Skills. I'm now doing with the Complete Art of War. So hopefully that'll get me uh, my Ferrari and my uh, <laughs> Jojo. Not that I want one, but... It's, it's basically hitting the mainstream rather than the martial art world, like the business community, you know, all these self-help business books. Some, um, some Japanese ideas have become hugely popular, isn't it? And they start to sell millions. Yeah. I know that's not why you're doing it. You're doing it because you love what you're doing. I can see that. Let's move on to the teaching. Because you've also done, apart from, uh, you know, getting a few people annoyed about the actual research, you've now started your own clan or school of ninjutsu based upon all of this knowledge. Many people, I know because I followed your work, many people criticize you. Many people are actually really happy about it, that somebody is brave enough to say, well, let's just experiment with this stuff. Let's do it. Let's try it. And uh, as far as I understand, you're doing it as you're not actually teaching for money per se. Um, you have groups that are free. So you're not just trying to, you know, make stacks of money as a grandmaster. You're not presenting yourself as a grandmaster. You are presenting yourself as a researcher who's willing to share all of this interesting knowledge and have groups that can try to use it. Is that, am I correct in saying that? Yes. The actual yeah. school to run costs me more than we bring in. Yeah. Oh, it's definitely not done for money. It is free. What I've done is, so basically this family gave me permission to reopen this original school. That's why those two big books I've shown you, we work off that. Because what I want to do is, it's the only one I found that was totally in context. So if you mm. buy the other, you get the Chikamatsu one, you're like, well, you need the other scrolls and it's all over the place and... The Ban Sen Shukwai, the Book of Ninja, is just one and there's nothing else with it. As I said, this guy, who was actually a war tactician for the second most powerful fam uh, family in Japan, he wrote from beginning to end. It's right there. So with the family giving me permission, I said, right, let's open this. Let's do it. And I, I, I'm not called Sensei. I refuse to be called Sensei. Mm. I don't claim to be one. I am not called Grandmaster or anything <laughs> like that. I give myself the illustrious title of Project Leader. Good. So it's just a project because that's all it is. I suppose it is real training in the sense that we genuinely want to follow this way of the samurai, but it's also a bit of experimental archaeology. Mm. Get it right. So it's one camp in the Iaido stroke. You know, we follow the way of the samurai, and one camp in the let's make some gunpowder. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. So, but yes, it's free to join. I don't charge anybody anything. What we do is we ask for £10 if you want to register and get a number and a name. And 50% of that goes to the temple as a donation. And 50% goes to me to sort of like keep it afloat. Uh, the only money we've ever tried to get in is from a friend of mine or one of the top guys in there in my school sort of job. He runs a course and he 
and he charges a pound every article that they do. And there's quite a lot of articles, but it, it, it means he works for something like two pound fifty an hour. You know, <laughs> you know, in the end. So some people have some of the haters have gone, I was just trying to make money. I'm like, I promise you, we are not making money. <laughs> Because I do want people to experience, how can I say this? There's um, there's definitely people who out there want to put on kimono, hakama. They want to learn in a dojo. But yeah, I've been to all these dojos and it's rubbish. It's not real. It's not right. That's not what Samurai did. Most people don't realize that, you know, kendo and kudo and iaido was really changed just before the war or just after the And they, they yes. actually don't represent so much of the original swordsmanship and i want to give the reality back how are you keeping a kind of technical standard to ensure that at least there's some semblance of you know like yes. sword swordsmanship is at least basically correct and mar the martial the jiu-jitsu side or something how do you do you have a technical advisor what how does that work well that that's the big thing here that's probably one of the reasons it doesn't sell massively well is because in all of them eight volumes, there's almost no martial arts. Mm. It's all military tactics. Mm. So, for example, when you cross a river, you have to crouch down, your helmet down, and give a smaller target. But your mm. boat has to be lacquered, your string has to be lacquered, and you have to use lacquered arrows, uh, you know, to get across. So, for example, when I was working with a translator today, we were discussing there's three things you observe when you cross a river. The first one is you look in the shadows of trees in case the enemy are there. The second one is little, almost like little oxbow lakes or little indents in the riverside for people hiding. And then you check behind embankments. You then look at the colour of the water. If the water is muddy, it means somebody is upstream muddy in the water to stop you seeing the trip wire. And you're talking with about 10,000 men. So, you know, and then the former, it's all that sort of stuff. It's all that. Yeah. And yeah. like, so what we have, so the point I'm trying to make is that people are like, that's all well and good and it's cool, but I want to run around with a sword. <laughs> so this guy who runs the courses for me is actually qualified in Daito Ryu. So he runs mm -hmm. Daito Ryu alongside Natural mm -hmm. Ryu. Mm -hmm. So the self-defense aspect is technically sound and so on. How yeah. about the sword, the sword work? That would you come, have... no, that comes again from Daito Ryu. Okay. Cool. There's only a handful of sword techniques, which is draw with the left sword if your hand is restrained. Mm -hmm. But they're more situational. It implies that you know how to handle a sword because you're a samurai. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like you know what you're doing with a sword, but here's what happens if somebody grabs your hands and you can't do anything. Yeah, and it must just be really fun. Like, I, I guess you guys go for a weekend. I don't know, you go out camping or something, and you've got all the survival skills. All of this in the books must be really fun just to experiment and useful because if the zombie apocalypse ever happens, you guys are going to have a lot of very cool tricks and, uh, you know, really, it's survival skills, isn't it? A lot of it. It's, it's actually, the name is called Gungaku, which in Japanese means military study. Mm. The idea is that you study the military and inside of that it says you have to find a teacher that you trust to teach you swordsmanship and spearsmanship. So in the school, it actually says, go, how can I say? So there's a myth in Japan where that you can only study with one school. That's totally inaccurate. It's not, mm. you can only study with one sword school. You can only study with one spear school, but you must study multiple schools or yeah. your family traditions. So yeah, we basically, the lads will come here for a weekend, but most are in America. So they kindly uh, flew me out to America, which was my wow. first time. And then, yeah, we were chopping things up and blowing <laughs> stuff up, you know, the usual. Yeah, yeah. One more question is about the Tenshin Shodan Katori Shinto Yu, which you visited once or more times. Otake Sensei, of course, is world famous. He's, he looks awesome. Um, and I've seen a little bit of video with you, you two together, and he kindly gave you some some information to use in your book. Um, so what about his ninjutsu knowledge and the, the knowledge in that Katori Shinto Ryu? How does that fit in with the rest of that? And also, what was your impression of Otake Sensei in the, the dojo? Yeah. 
it was totally different dojo experience. It was a, definitely a traditional dojo. I have nothing but good words for uh, Katori Shintoryu. Otaki Sensei was one of the <coughs> best, best guys I've been to visit. Now, I, 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 so I'm not going to name any names, but they're, forgetting Hatsumi, I don't mean Hatsumi, other traditional, fully qualified Japanese masters have offered my translators black belts if they will do a certain thing. I've been offered grades for certain things if I gave them free books. And one of the worst ones was they said, oh, I've got a gift for you. And they said, I'll sign it and gave me their book and then charged me double for it or something daft. I was like, these people who think the Japanese are this, no, they're... Let me just, let me just put it this way. My friend who spent most of his life in Japan said it. He watches students come and give the Japanese like these really daft gifts about like they've tried some kanji to do or something. He says you buy them a porno mag, a bottle of whiskey and a pack of fags. Well, happy. <laughs> that is the truth behind Japanese martial arts. I promise you. These guys are not what you imagine. But Itaki Sensei was genuinely a wonderful man. He was very polite, very nice, enthusiastic, and he gave it for free. I was like, oh, here we go, another trick. But no, he was like, do it. And we were very welcome in his school. That was all brilliant. But his, the ninjutsu, like he said, it's just such a small element that's been passed down. And a lot of people don't realize that there's bits of Katori Shintoru that are missing. It's not a complete school anymore. It was how, once, but like... How do we know? How do we know that? Uh, there are plenty of scrolls out there with extra bits that are now missing. So there'll be a scroll on this and there'll be a scroll on that. That's not to say it's like a bad school or anything. It's got loads. It's one of the biggest schools there is. But, for example, even in the Natori stuff, uh, there's stuff missing. It just, as time goes on, people forget certain things or swap them out or, you know, change them over. So but Katori Shintori is one of the biggest curriculums there is at the moment that's out there. And yeah. it was just or oral tradition. I saw on the NHK documentary about the Katori Shintoryu, every time they pass their like five year exam, they get given a scroll that's progressively longer. So, I mean, they look awesome, these scrolls. And like, I think he mentions in his book, Otake Sensei, the longest is like 30 plus meters. And even he is trying to unravel this last scroll that he can't yeah. fully comprehend. It's very mystical and lots of, um, cosmological mystical practices so have you is that you've obviously seen these scrolls but have you um are the scrolls from the ninjutsu schools and the samurai schools are they similar like that they're long 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 scrolls literally long scrolls like that or are they more books you get three types of things in J scrolls in japan you get what's called a mokuroku which is just a list and that's the sort of stuff they're talking about these long lists of this skill that skill that skill and they have to remember those from memory most of the mm. time. And that's where things get lost. I'm not, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying now they're losing things. They're keeping it strong now. But like from the 1600s to the 1700s, bits or stuff is gone. Uh, but then the other one you get is um, the, the, the title of the skill plus some memorandums. So it, you can't really understand it, but you get a gist. You know, just literally, if you know the skill, that'll prompt your memory and think it. Then you get the... Boom, here's a book tome with everything written out in full. And that's basically what we've been translating, those long, complicated ones. So from a ninjutsu point of view, Tako, um, the um, Katori information is not so much. It's quite small. And it's oral tradition. It's not written down in a scroll, which makes it not so, you know, reliable from a historical point of view. That also makes sense of something. I always thought if these scrolls are so secret, uh, like Don Drager, when he passed away, he gave his scrolls back to the school. And I always thought, what happens when people pass away? There must be hundreds of Katori Shintoryu scrolls. But it doesn't matter because they're only lists, in fact. They're not, you, you have to receive the oral transmission. It's the same in Chinese martial arts. You may get this long list that sound very mystical, but you've no idea what they really mean. Even if you think you do, you can't be sure. You've got to receive the oral transmission. Yeah, That's very, very interesting. What about your own practice, Anthony? What do you practice from all of this, your lifetime of study? What, do you, what are you interested in for your own development and, and martial art practice? That's actually the bit that is starting to annoy me, is I don't get to practice. 
I've oh, the only thing I practice is a crooked back at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> I literally wake up in the morning, take these dogs for a walk, and then I start work. And I'm genuinely quite jealous of other people studying my stuff because most of the time I'm spent on the next year. So I write an average 2.5 books a year. So I am really struggling for time. And of course, I live in the middle of nowhere. I live out in the middle of Wales. I did study. I like the idea of body mechanics. I like the idea of um, learning locks, learning how to get out of locks, how tissue you know, responds, that type of thing. But I'll be honest with you, that training sort of stopped for me about 10 years ago and this just took over. Mm. But as you get older, do you feel you're going to start to do something just to keep yourself, you know, active and healthy? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Well, Wales is great. You can go mountain, mountain walking. You're near to big mountains and, you know. Basically, I walk a lot now is, is what I yeah. do for health. And I like archery. Mm. Japanese archery is quite good. But what I would love to do, but I'm actually running out of translators because that you you sort of burn them out after a while. <laughs> you need to give them a break. But what I'd like to do is go through Japanese swordsmanship because, believe it or not, I think it's wrong. Mm. I, I, I knew the ninja was wrong. Now I'm sure Japanese swordsmanship is mm, there's something not right about it. Mm. This brings us back to... What has been the response, okay, 10 years from the beginning to now? Have people slowly warmed up to your ideas from the Bujin Kan organization because they are the, you know, the big organization? Are they now starting to say, Anthony, thank you. You've actually done a good service or are they still critical of what you're doing? <laughs> <laughs> you've got two camps. You've got the I love Anthony Cummins and you've got the I hate him, I want him to die. <laughs> and that's it. There okay. isn't a middle ground. A couple of people said, oh, I don't really care about you. But those <laughs> ones clearly hate me. <laughs> yeah. So there are a few, like, there are a few um, groups on Facebook and they just slag me off all day. Uh, okay. However, I've been told, because I, I got rid of Facebook in the end, but I've been told that there are more people now defending it and saying, actually, hold on, Let, you know, maybe he's right. Mm. And my intention, as, and, and my intention is always, you should never try to destroy somebody else's livelihood. That's their livelihood. That's fine. Mm. But for prosper, prosperity, we need to know what the truth is. So guys in the booty can't yet yeah, keep training all that, but do realize that might, you know, there's actually historical evidence here that shows the opposite of what, what went on. And it's the same with swordsmanship, but I'll, as I say, I'll need somebody else, but I think swordsmanship has gone through a transition. And when you read the old manuals, it's, hold on, how can I say? I had an email from a friend the other day, mm. who went to one of these Koryu schools and, they, and a student in front of him said, why do we do it so slow? And they said, because samurai honor each other and would never attack from behind. And therefore you don't have to, you know, defend yourself quickly against someone else. I'm like what an utter load mm. of rubbish mm. you know one of the scrolls i've translated actually gives the skill of how to distract people while you kill them from this side and you mm. blind them with a third person and what about the Mi miyamoto masashi story where they all wait for him in a group yeah so you're telling me that's not true like on one hand they all sit there reading go going no show miyamoto masashi and how he defended himself against multiple people and in the same class say samurai are honorable they don't do, stab you in the back and multiple attacks. Yeah. It's like, no, no, no. Hate is probably going to come with that. <laughs> but I would like but to train in swordsmanship. But you've had a lot of ex Bujinkan people also come and join your, your training and yeah. show appreciation for what you're doing, I guess. Mm. Some, some of them are spies, though. That's obvious. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're trying to use ninjutsu, and you're like, come on. But <laughs> well, you can see. You can, <laughs> I can sort of see that one. <laughs> uh, is there anything you would like to say, you know, to your readers or uh, to anyone watching this about your work or anything, anything extra? We particularly like stories, and you've told some really cool stories. Any more interesting characters you met in Japan that, you know, stood out or anything mystical that happened or anything interesting? Well, 
I'll be honest with you, I, I tend not to give the mystical stuff out, but I can't help but realise that some stuff happens. Like, scr I walked up to a, a building that was just glass, like this, in the middle of nowhere, it was a hot day, I was with Yoshie, and it said library on it, and I was like, we just visited a castle, like the, the 1500th fake castle in Japan we visited, really sort of like tired, and I said, should we go in and should we ask? And she was like, no, we've been in a million libraries, let's go home. So I went home and I thought, you know what? I'm going to just check that guy's website. I've not checked it in about a year, but I'm just, I'm bored. Let's have a check. And he said, and he just posted that day, oh, there's um, XX Library. It was the same library I've been to that very day. And he'd only just posted about it or just put it back on his website. Someone's there. And then I went, so I said, Yoshi, this six hour away trip, we've got to go back. And she went, there's, you can go back. I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> so I went back and we've got the listings. Turns out they've got the secret scrolls of Natoru, 10 of them that I'd never, that I needed. And they were just there. And they said, oh yeah, a photograph. There you go. Thank you. But you know, there's loads of little coincidences like that that came up and then gave me these scrolls. Like, you know, like the grave being pushed over by a typhoon that which led me to the family. And, you know, yes. this little knock on effect like that. Yes. However, I'll be honest with you, those have stopped coming now. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing mystical has happened for a long time. But just clearly something something was going on. Yeah, when you look in retrospect, yeah, it was like a hand of fate pushing you towards, uh, you know, from the time you're, you were in the toy shop with the little ninja toys to... Uh... Oh, it all pushes me. So very yeah. quick, there's another one like, where we went to another museum just called the Sakura Museum. And we picked up this magazine, and, and whenever I go to museums, I like to buy little bits, you know, just in case. And I picked this magazine up, it had nothing to do with ninjas. It was just the, the, the museum's local magazine, if you like, or something like that. So it was randomly once a month in time. So I said, let's just get a copy. It's a fiver. Here you go. And she's opening, she's looking through Yoshi, and she went, oh, look, there's a Kusunoki. Uh, long story, but basically there's this, you know, collection. And we looked through it. And it had in this collection the ninja scroll that we needed uh, the name of it and said this library's got this ninja scroll a totally different museum library so we went to this library and they've got this ninja scroll and they're photocopying it or photographing it and it was like oh my god but by accident they pulled out an extra book that was beneath this one and it was one of the other missing scrolls because it has the same cover and it's the 28 chinese Oh, sorry, the eight Chinese formations, military formations manual of the school I've resurrected. Just like <laughs> unbelievable. Awesome. I'll tell you a very quick story. Similar yeah. thing happened. Considered one of the world's top um, reservoirs of Chinese manuals and books and things like that. And somehow I managed to get a Chinese friend to introduce me because you have to be introduced. And I got in there talked to the head librarian. It turned out he had studied the same Chinese martial art as me in Beijing when he was younger with this very famous master. And in the one particular room, which was full up with all the kind of military and medical stuff, there was a whole filing cabinet of letters between different Chinese martial art masters with super detail of technical, you know, teachings. And I asked him again, could I, could I photograph? He said, yeah, just go ahead and do it. So I spent the afternoon. It was fantastic and got it translated. Oh, so nice. those kind of experiences, it's almost like, I don't know, fortuitous and th yeah, the hand of fate is helping you. It's really wonderful to talk, Anthony. And um, I hope we can have you back on when your next book comes out and discuss what further revelations and interesting stories. Is there anything you'd like to finish with? Uh, on a personal note or about your books, anything at all? Basically, I'd like to say out there that there's been this, this sort of like, maybe in China as well, but for the samurai especially, we, there's been like 500 years since they were actually at war and things have changed a lot. And we need to get rid of what we call the Japanese spell. The Japanese people are genuinely wonderful people. I mean that. They have one of the best societies in the world. They're peaceful. Everything's on time. Everything works. They're great people. But they're also just people. They're not these mystical samurai guys, you know. And, they, and what you've got to remember is some of these master martial artists are actually just factory workers or businessmen. And they're not 
paid samurai who go and kill people. And Ooh. sometimes the things have changed. So my main point is, which would you prefer? Would you prefer to read the English translation of a real samurai from those times? Or would you prefer pass something that's been passed on for 500 years being told to you by someone just because he looks, you know, he's Japanese and he speaks the same language? Which would you prefer? You know, and for me, I want to speak to real samurai really from the time. And yeah. we can do that through scrolls. Wonderful. Keep up the good work. Congratulations on your latest book. And I will make a review of your of the book you kindly sent me uh, next week. And it will be part of our martial art book series. So I look forward to all of your forthcoming books. You're doing a really good work, Anthony. And thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you.